returning to the show is Dr. Ivan Moroshnikov. Dr. Moroshnikov is a guest researcher at the University of Oslo, where he participates in the project Story Worlds in Transition, Coptic Apocrypha and Changing Contexts in the Byzantine and Early Islamic Periods. His research interests include Coptic philology and dialectology, as well as early Christian studies. He is the author of the Gospel of Thomas and Plato, which is an open resource available on Brill, and has published widely in the field of Coptic apocryphal literature. So, Yvonne, welcome back to the show. I so, love to be yeah. back. I really enjoyed our previous talk, and I'm really looking forward to this one. Before we get into the Coptic apocryphal texts themselves, could you elaborate further on what we mean by New Testament apocrypha? Talking about apocrypha, and specifically New Testament apocrypha, the definition is always a problem. If you do some research, you'll find a bunch of definitions. So my colleague, Professor Hugo Lukauk, in the Oslo project, they have their own definition. So they define apocrypha as texts and traditions that expand or develop on the biblical story world. So the idea is that there is a biblical story world which is different from the story world of, let's say, patristic literature or martyrdom literature. And this story world is somehow fixed because we have a canon. And there is a, a sort of like fan fiction kind of addendum to this corpus, which is the apocryphal corpus, which tries to expand our knowledge about this so-called biblical story world. We can debate about definitions forever. I personally don't really find this very helpful. I think this definition is good enough. The only possible commentary that it requires is that the word uh, apocryphon itself, it's a Greek word. It's important to understand that the people who wrote apocrypha, most of them, probably would disagree with us labeling these texts apocryphal because in Egypt, for example, but surely not only in Egypt, at a rather early stage, the word apocryphal, meaning hidden in Greek, became associated with some clandestine activity. So apocryphal texts are those composed by heretics, by people who are outside of the great church, by the enemies of this church. So when we read the most important Coptic writer, Shenouta, Shenouta would always use these words basically in the same sentence, heresy and apocryph apocryphal. But surprisingly, this doesn't mean that this sort of literature did not really prosper in Shenouta's time or in later times. In fact, the, the monastery, which was founded by Shenouta, the so-called White Monastery, is where most of our apocryphal texts come from. It's just the word itself is probably not, as I said, not what they themselves would call it. So they would rather talk about, you know, some sort of embellishments, some uh, beautiful additions that by no means problematize the orthodoxy. There is, in fact, this very famous passage, which all my colleagues uh, know and love. It's in this author called Sudi Evodius of Rome which is a completely fictional character, allegedly a bishop of Rome. He never existed, really. And this made-up character actually, you know, is credited with several works. And one of them is a homily on the Passion of Christ. And it's a very interesting text, apocryphal text, full of remarkable, fantastic details. Really fun read. And at some point, the author basically takes the mask off and admits to not actually being Evodius to be in somebody else. And he says, well, surely nobody would judge us for adding these embellishments, these beautiful elements to the gospel story. Surely we will only be thanked for making the gospel story even more glorious than it is. That's an important distinction, right? And this is not to say that we don't have texts that actually call themselves apocryphal. So, for instance, the Gospel of Thomas is an important exception because it begins with this statement that, you know, these are the secret words that Jesus spoke. And in the Greek text, it actually uses the word uh, apocryphos. And then we have, of course, uh, the uh, text known as the Apocryphon of John, where the word apocryphon is actually in the title. So surely not for everybody this word was non-kosher, but like for a past corpus of texts, this is probably not how they would self-define, how they would see themselves. But again, as I said, I don't think this is really important. We make our own definitions. 
And we simply, if they help us understand what we're dealing with, they're fine. The one that I, I gave you, the one of the Oslo team, I think it's good enough. Today, we're talking about some texts that not only are apocryphal, but they're specifically Coptic apocryphal. For those in the audience who are unaware, what exactly is the Coptic language? The Coptic language is defined as the last stage in the history of the Egyptian language. So it's basically the same language as the one that's used in the Book of the Dead. But, you know, languages evolve. So, for instance, we can also say that French is basically the same language as Latin. But, of course, there is a huge difference. So over the course of its development, the Coptic language, it acquired certain distinct features, which we don't find in the earlier varieties of Egyptian. One thing that immediately is easily recognizable is that Coptic is written down with an alphabetic script. So at some point, somebody realized that it's easier to represent this language using the, the letters of the Greek alphabet, plus the additional characters from you know the earlier stages of the uh, Egyptian. There is a lot of things that we still don't know about all this. Like, for instance, it has been long suggested that the idea to use the Greek script for this, it was an idea invented by Christian missionaries. But in fact, there is research that shows that there are already pre-Christian attempts to write down Egyptian using the Greek alphabet. So this sort of practices existed prior to the advent of Christian missionaries. There is another argument which I like, which I think is a very strong one, is that in many regional traditions, we have this same figures credited with the discovery of the script. So, for instance, we have Mesrop Mashtots in Armenia, we, we have uh, Ulfila for the Gothic script, we have Cyril and Methodius for the Church Slavonic script, but the Coptic script does not actually have a founding father, which may mean that it's actually not a Christian invention, that it actually is something that was invented as I said, prior to the advent of Christian missionaries. Unfortunately, we don't have any evidence. But in any case, Coptic is the last stage, as I said, of the Egyptian language. It existed as a multitude of different dialects. So for the first time in the history of Egyptian, the language is written down in a way that allows you to see the vowels. And immediately we can see that words were vocalized differently in different areas of Egypt. And this dialects coexisted. In the first millennium, the most influential dialect was the dialect of the south, which is known as the Sahidic dialect from the Arabic word Sa'id, which means south. And uh, eventually the dominant role was uh, transferred to the dialect of the north, which is known as the Bukharic dialect. And this is the dialect that is still used in the Coptic liturgy. So today you go to a Coptic church in Egypt, in the United States, and some part of the service will be in this dialect of Coptic. But at some point in the Middle Ages, the language sadly became extinct. So at some point, people switched to Arabic. So today, Coptic is a dead language, if indeed there is such a thing as a dead language. Which is, of course, a problem for us because, you know, people who study manuscripts, we would really love to have some help from a native speaker who could explain to us what this means or, you know, how this phrase works. Unfortunately, we cannot do it, so we all need to rely on manuscripts to explain manuscripts. This is also something that makes it a lot of fun, this, this kind of research. It's very important just to kind of understand the language in general um, and you know, what the possibilities it was used for. This is Egyptian demotic late stage language being transliterated through Greek alphabets and lots of Greek loan words. So this is reflective, I think, of a very cosmopolitan world. These people are from all over the empire. And this is obviously a, a remnant of what happened after the conquest of Alexander, you know, the, the different generals who took over and created what we call the Hellenistic Empire into the Roman Empire, you still have native Demotic speakers. And the people up in the higher echelons are Greek speakers, but the the normal you know, everyday person is probably native Egyptian. So it's kind of this melding of cultures and there's this clash. And like you mentioned, 
There are different dialects as well, and this makes things very complicated. When you start to learn Coptic, I think the text that I have uh, by Bentley Layden is the Sahidic Coptic. Yeah. But as you say, there are tons of different dialects. And those of you who are familiar in Gnostic studies will know that the Nag Hammadi texts were composed in Coptic. And not only that, but there's also a question of, you know, like Dr. Maroshnika was saying, there, there are different dialects reflected within those texts themselves as well. What are our sources of these Coptic apocryphal texts? You mentioned Shunute. Where are we pulling these texts from? As you probably know, the situation with the Coptic manuscript tradition is extremely complicated. For instance, one of the main or maybe the most important source of our manuscript is the so-called White Monastery. And this is where apparently around a thousand codices on parchment, really expensive codices, were once housed. But unfortunately, today, we don't have a single complete codex from this repository. So all the manuscripts are in fragments, which means that sometimes we have a choir that is like a certain block of parchment leaves pressed together. Sometimes we have individual leaves, and sometimes we have tiny fragments, which may or may not join other fragments. And uh, all these fragments are uh, housed at different libraries across the world. So we have the largest collection in Paris, in the National Library of France in Paris. There is a large collection in London at the British Library. There is stuff in Moscow, in New York, in Cairo. So basically the work that scholars of Coptic manuscripts do is detective work. You try to track down pieces of uh, fragments of the same codex of the same manuscript. And then from this almost always a partially preserved text, you try to squeeze some information and uh, this would eventually yield some knowledge about uh, this literature. So we have this fragmentary evidence in Coptic. And then we have translations, because as I said, the Coptic church eventually started using Arabic. And uh, there was a great movement for translating Coptic texts into the Arabic language. And today we have many texts that survive only in fragments in Coptic, but survive completely in Arabic. And then after that, Eventually, the Ethiopian church received this tradition, and then texts that were translated into Arabic were subsequently translated into ancient Ethiopic. So we have this thing called Coptic, Arabic, Ethiopic, a literary tradition, literary trajectory. And sometimes it's only with the help of these later translations that we can kind of try and reconstruct the situation that existed in the first millennium, which is reflected in these fragmentary manuscripts. Coptic apocryphal literature is manifold. We have texts of various genres. The people here in Oslo are especially interested in this genre called the apostolic memoirs, so texts that have usually some sort of a framework, some sort of discovery story, so they are ascribed to certain champions of the Orthodox faith from the glorious past of the Miaphysite church. And these uh, church fathers are described to come, say, to Jerusalem, visit library or a house, and then to discover a small book, which would then contain some amazing story about Jesus, about a crucifixion or about some events that happened before the creation of mankind or when angels were battling with each other when satan was you know thrown away from the sky a colleague of mine florian graz here in oslo is writing a dissertation about this topic it's an extremely interesting synthesis of what we know about this so far but as i said there are many other genres so i specifically work on apocryphal acts so on various stories that deal with the disciples of Jesus and how they travel across the known universe and preach the gospel and eventually die as martyrs.
because according to the Coptic tradition, all apostles, with the exception of John, died as martyrs. You mentioned before the kind of fan fiction aspect of apocryphal literature. What would be some of the reasons to compose these texts? Would it be primarily biographical, liturgical? If you could just kind of touch upon that. There are several reasons, and definitely liturgical is, liturgy is the key word here. Many of the texts that we deal with contain dates. So, for instance, as I mentioned, there are stories about the martyrdoms, how apostles die as martyrs, and why these stories are important, because there is always a date for the death of the apostle. And this is the day on which a certain celebration takes place. So the idea is that there is this annual liturgical circle and there are commemoration dates. And on each particular date, we have a certain set of saints or events that are to be celebrated. Therefore, we need a text or a corpus of texts that should be used liturgically during this festival. Now, unfortunately, we don't really know much about how this Coptic text were performed. Like, for instance, we know that today Coptic monks read a certain set of texts during their uh, meals, right? Like a collective of monks gather together in a refectory and, they, and one of them stands in front of them and reads out certain pious literature so that they eat and not forget about God and everything. But we don't really know when this practice emerged. And a colleague of mine at the University of Bergen here in Norway actually is writing a dissertation about this and related topics. And she, as far as I know, was unable to find any evidence more ancient than 19th century for this sort of practice. This doesn't mean that it didn't exist, but we don't have any evidence. So as I said, we don't really know exactly how these texts were performed. Another of my colleagues, Sam Cook, here in Oslo, he is writing a book about the monastery of St. Macarius in the Delta and the Bukharic manuscripts from this monastery, also late first millennium. And in those manuscripts, we sometimes have marginal notes that say something like, you know, don't read this, this is false, or skip this, read from here. So we know that sometimes the texts were apparently too long to be performed, so they, they needed to be abridged, or there was something problematic with this text, and so this part should be skipped. But unfortunately, as I said, there is still a lot that we don't know. But basically, the point is that somehow these apocryphal texts were necessary for the liturgical cycle and for liturgical performance during the feast days. So this is one reason. But then, of course, the other reason is, I would say, curiosity. We read the New Testament, and there are many parts, many storylines that are not as detailed as we would want, right? We don't know much about the childhood of Jesus, and that's why we have all these infancy gospels. We don't know much about the fates of the apostles except for Apostle Paul, who is the main protagonist of the uh, canonical acts of the apostles. So, I mean, I think this is perfectly understandable, right? So you have these great heroes of faith, and you know surprisingly little about them. So it makes sense to have certain interest in literature that would fill these gaps. Talking specifically about the apocryphal acts of the apostles, and specifically about the Coptic Acts of the Apostles, or, you know, texts that come from Egypt. One thing that I believe we can know for certain now is that one of the main sources of these stories, and those are fantastical stories, like bombastic stories full of miracles, resurrections, completely incredible events. One of the main sources for these stories were the so-called Byzantine Apostolic Lists. So this is a genre of literature that is still not very well researched. It's a very short texts, two, three pages, that basically give you a list of the apostles and the disciples of the apostles and some two or three sentences, main facts of their biographies. Like, you know, Apostle Philip, he preached in, in the country of Phrygia and then he died a martyr's death 
in the city of Hierapolis, right? That's it. That's just two sentences. There are also texts that list like the relatives, whether or not an apostle had uh, children or wives or whether or not they had a mundane uh, profession, a vocation, like what, what they did before they actually started their religious careers. So these texts apparently started to pop up quite early. And uh, when you study Coptic Apocryphal Acts, you very soon realize that the main point is to provide some details, some story to these very short sentences we find in these apostolic lists. So, for instance, as I said, Philip is said to have preached in Phrygia. So now we have this text, relatively long text, which is all dedicated to, to this, how Philip was casting lots with all the other apostles, how Phrygia was allotted to him, how he was scared to go because he was not confident enough, and how Peter said that he would join him to give him some support, and how he how they travel there, whom they encounter on the way, what they find when they arrive, and so forth. So ultimately, the idea is that there is this kind of you know skeleton provided by the lists, and there was apparently some Coptic writer who thought that this is great stuff. I should just add details to this story, add some flesh to this skeleton. So yes, the second reason for the composition of this text is definitely curiosity and just general kind of interest in what happened to these great heroes of the past. But I'm sure there are other reasons too. I guess it all depends on each particular text and, you know, an in-depth analysis of every single text would probably provide more kind of reasons. But I think these two are key, like if we talk about this whole corpus in general. For me, just before we move on, when you were discussing the liturgical and the curiosity aspects, I like my personal favorite figure of apocryphal fan fiction that comes from basically like one sentence in the canonical text is the good bandit, right? You have like all these amazing, insane stories about how this guy helped Jesus and Mary and his dad, like when they were crossing into Egypt. I was so amazed by this. I think just an example from pop culture, for those of you who are comic book fans out there, think of a character who just even after 80 years, like Batman, Batman appears in a 10 page story in 1939, throwaway story, who knows if he'll be back again. And he amasses what we could term a canon over the years. And people who are later the kind of scribes or the authors who are creating these stories and, and creating the art are curious about like little throwaway lines or sentences or scenes or panels in these stories. And they create entire mini series or text mm -hmm. about it. So kind of think of it that way. That's how I, I do at least. So let's get into the text themselves, Yvonne. You've worked extensively on these apocryphal acts. So tell us more about your research. So these two texts are, I think, really nice examples of this sort of literature. So I think they both were composed originally in Coptic. They both draw inspiration from this uh, Byzantine apostolic lists. And I would say from other Byzantine texts, like there is this extremely popular uh, early apocryphal text known as the Acts of Andrew and Matthias in the City of the Cannibals, which was translated into all possible languages and was extremely popular across the Christian world in the first millennium. And this text clearly made a significant impact on, on Coptic apocryphal acts. And I mean, for everybody listening, I would strongly recommend this as some sort of an introduction to this sort of literature because it's, in a sense, really good literary work full of very nice details with a very thought-through structure. So basically, the Acts of Andrew and Matthias describe how Andrew and Matthias get separated at some point, the two apostles get separated, and Matthias goes to the city of the cannibals, which is, we don't know where it is, it's completely a fairy tale, like there are no real geography connected to this. Yeah, but they have yeah. cannibals there, so that's all we need to know. Yeah, 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 it's a city, like, because we do have this sort of stuff in antique geography that, you know, there are Egyptians, there are Nubians, Indians, whatever, and then Further, if you keep going in that direction, then you'll find like dog people and cannibal people and, you know, 
self-eating people, like all sorts of weird creatures. Yeah, not to our boy Herodotus. Yeah, so so there's this uh, city of the cannibals, and you know the cannibals are like really evil, and they capture Matthias and they want to eat him, but. Of course, Matthias prays to God, and uh, God saves him and releases him from prison. And then Andrew comes, and together they perform all sorts of miracles and commit a little genocide of the cannibals, uh, so kill the most evil ones, then the rest convert. So it's a fantastic story which was composed in Greek and uh, was very soon translated into Coptic. And I think it kind of provided a model for many of these later texts that were composed in, in Coptic initial. So the Acts of Andrew and Philemon is basically, well, either a prequel or a sequel. It's not entirely clear, but it's a text that is very clearly aware of this Acts in the City of the Cannibals and is constantly alluding to various events described in this text. So the main characters here are Andrew, which is one of the most popular apostles in Egypt, and Philemon. Now, we don't really know who this guy is. He is described as a little boy, a child, who has a beautiful voice. A voice that has this miraculous power, so he can basically make even the most evil, the person who is, you know, dedicated pagan, this voice can make them immediately repent and convert to Christianity. What I argue in my work is that in all likelihood, this Philemon is to be identified with this little boy mentioned in the Gospel of John. So there is this episode about the multiplication of fish and bread. In the Gospel of John, Andrew finds a boy, and this boy brings the you know two fishes and uh, bread, and then Jesus multiplies this stuff. And that's all. It's just like one verse in the Gospel mentioning a boy and some connection to Andrew. So apparently this was enough. And in later texts, in Coptic texts, we find some sort of a paraphrase uh, of this story. And in this paraphrase, which is part of a work ascribed to Cyril of Jerusalem. So in this paraphrase, the boy is explicitly called Philemon. And it is explicitly said that he has this sweet voice. So in all likelihood, this is the same boy. And the idea would be that after the miracle, the boy decided to go along. So he went with the apostles, with Andrew specifically, and became uh, Andrew's disciple. And then together, Andrew and Philemon went to Asia Minor to preach the Gospels. So yeah, uh, this is indeed like one of these very typical features of this literature, right? That even an unnamed character from the Bible, which is mentioned in a single verse, all of a sudden gets uh, his own story and uh, his own um, kind of narrative. Indeed, uh, the story is pretty exciting. As I said, it's, it's happening in Asia Minor. It has two parts. The first part is about the conversion of people in the city of Lydda. And the second part is apparently somewhere in Lycaonia. Uh, the second part is much longer. It begins with two boys whom Satan makes fight each other, and then one of the boys dies. And the father of the boy that apparently killed the other boy is accused of crime, and he runs to Andrew and asks Andrew to intervene, and instead Andrew sends Philemon. So this little boy comes to the rescue of another boy who killed the third boy. Then Philemon is captured, he's being tortured, and he summons birds. And this is my favorite part of this story. So there is this kind of a beauty contest uh, for the birds. And uh, the first bird to come is a sparrow. And a sparrow volunteers to like do whatever Philemon says and to send the message. But apparently Philemon does not trust sparrows because they are too sexually active. And Philemon is afraid that if this male sparrow sees a female sparrow, he would immediately forget all about his mission and would just you know, procreate, which is, again, something that you find in antiquity a lot. There is this whole idea that there are animals who are somehow moral and have certain you know, ethical qualities, and then there are animals who have this excessive sexual behavior and therefore should not be in any form imitated. So apparently, according to this text, sparrows are like this. 
Then there is a, a crow. And again, Philemon is not happy because apparently in the days of Noah, a crow did not do what it was supposed to do, it did not come back with the message. And then finally, there is a dove, a female dove, and the dove is good enough for the task. So then the dove comes and addresses a multitude of people who are mourning the death of the child. And then there is another nice detail because the dove, of course, can speak and everybody is amazed. And it says that, well, this is exactly the language that animals and people spoke before the transgression. And this is, again, something that we do find in Byzantine literature and in late antique literature, that before transgression, before the fall, Adam and Eve could speak animal language, and all the animals spoke the same language. And this was somehow an ability that people lost after the, uh, the fall. So the story goes on and on, and the boy is resurrected, and everybody's happy. But Satan goes on and tries to still intervene with what's happening. So he captures, he goes inside the wife of the governor, and the wife kills her own son. So this is like yet another child in this story. And the apostles come to see what happened. And when they see the woman, they see also a small, well, in the text it says an Ethiopian. So an Ethiopian held by the woman by his heir and trying to escape and not capable to escape. So it turns out that this is one of the demons sent by Satan. And uh, the demon successfully entered the woman and made her kill her child. But then somehow, miraculously, the, the woman captured the demon. And uh, the demon is, in the Coptic text, is portrayed as an Ethiopian because this was uh, apparently a very common thing in this late antique tradition to in Egypt specifically to portray the demons as either black or Ethiopian. David Brachy actually in his work thinks that this motif is also connected to excessive sexuality, which often is the case, although here it's probably not. And then there is this whole discussion between the demon and Andrew, and finally the demon is cast into hell and the boy again is resurrected and everybody's happy. The end. So this is kind of a very typical story for this Coptic apocryphal literature. So it's, as I said, it's full of miracles. It's full of specifically of resurrections. Sometimes, and this is also a specifically Coptic feature, there is dismemberment. Like not only a child is murdered, but the child is also cut into pieces. And then, of course, the apostles come and piece those bodies together and they bring them back to life and everybody's happy. These stories clearly are based on certain Byzantine traditions, on the pre-existing Byzantine traditions, but they also have a lot of kind of local flavor. So, as I said, like certain details and certain vocabulary immediately marks this text as specifically coming from Coptic Egypt. The stories are extremely fun. If you want to learn more, you will definitely find more stuff like this in the volumes edited by Tony Burke. A lot of the motifs you just mentioned for this text are found in lots and lots of these other apocryphal texts. Just getting on the dismemberment part, like I know there's like so many insane traditions about the head of John the Baptist. This thing mm -hmm. just like levitates, goes around and preaches years after he was like beheaded. I love all these malleable stories. We were just talking about the talking dove. I have to go back and read this more because if there's one thing you know, I love the acts of Peter and Paul. I love that talking baby. I love that talking dog the epic rap battles between Simon of Samaria and Peter, all these fantastic tales. When I was talking to Dr. Burke about New Testament Apocrypha, I really likened these texts, and not just the apocryphal acts, but also the monastic bioi, things like that, as almost like the Marvel comics of late antiquity. <laughs> Think of how rich and kaleidoscopic it would have been. You don't know anything about Jesus? Well, you have the infancy gospel of Thomas, where he turns clay pigeons into real pigeons or whatever and then he kills his teachers and and kids who bump into him on the school bus you know so it's just uh all these rich traditions one of the reasons i wanted to talk about this aspect of your research actually came from our first discussion when we were talking about gospel of thomas because just the nature of gospel of thomas just how the texts were constructed and the coptic versus the greek sources and 
these sayings, these logia, right? It's kind of similar to how malleable some of these traditions in these apocryphal acts are. You mentioned that you know, you'll find a narrative situation in one text that will be appropriated to another text. So just getting into how adaptable these things are, just touch upon how they could be adapted to different scenarios, depending on the motivations of the writer and what the text is actually going to be used for, whether it be liturgical, instructive, etc. That's very true that these traditions and these texts, they were basically like clay. And people could make different forms, different figures from them. And this was not in any way considered to be like disrespectful of the tradition, which is amazing. As far as I know, and this is not just my opinion, the, the Coptic literature can be divided into two main corpora. So there is one corpus of texts that have the highest possible reputation, like the Bible or the works of Shenouta or the works of some other church fathers. And these texts were not meant to be messed around. Like they were supposed to be transmitted in the form they are. Although even that does not always hold. Like sometimes we do find that even in the biblical text, there are some remarkable changes. But generally speaking, this kind of textual corpus was more or less stable when it comes to textual transmission. And then there is this other literature which was very fluid and prone to constant change. And sometimes we cannot really know why people would change certain detail, but clearly this was not a problem for them. This was something that was done again and again. To give you an example, this text that I translated for Tony Burke's volume, The Preaching of Philip, there is this amazing episode when Philip and Peter come to Phrygia which is apparently a city rather than a country. And there is a city wall and a gate, and there is a pillar on top of the gate. And this probably reflects some actual architectural tradition of of the time. So the apostles pray, and the gate with the tower somehow becomes alive-ish. And they bend down so that the top of the pillar touches the earth, so that then this person who is not named in the text but who accompanies the apostles can get on top of the pillar, after which the pillar again becomes erect. And from on top of this pillar, this unnamed man preaches to the entire city and, you know, invites everybody to repent and to convert to Christianity. So, you know, very interesting, a very original story. What is interesting is that there is this one manuscript of the Acts of Andrew and Philemon, which has an additional act, which has a story that we don't find in any other manuscript of this text, in which has the very same episode. But here, instead of Peter and Philip, we have Andrew and Philemon, And instead of unnamed man, we have a dog. So in this version of the story, Andrew and Philemon pray to God, the pillar bends down, and then the dog goes on top of the pillar, and the dog preaches to the people of the city and asks them to repent. So very clearly, there is a literary connection here. Very clearly, somebody read the story, the preaching of Philip, and decided to make this story about Andrew and Philemon. And why is that? To be honest, I don't know. I, I have a theory which I which might be true, my, it might not be true. The theory goes like this. Uh, in the beginning of the narrative about Andrew and Philemon, for some reason we are told that the name of the father of Philemon was Philip. And that's all. It doesn't say anything else. So is it possible that somebody thought that, well, this Philip must be Philip the Apostle? And if Philemon is the son of Philip, then why wouldn't he perform the same miracle that his father performed? You know, like father, like son. And this kind of creates some sort of like a mirror image so that, you know, the Philemon, allegedly the son of Philip, repeats what his father 
did in, in some other area. I'm not kind of married to this suggestion, and it's really difficult to say whether this was the reason, but I think this is plausible because in the Coptic tradition, we do find this tendency not only to name the unnamed people, like we know that the boy from the Gospel of John is Philemon, but also to make them all somehow related to each other. And again, in many texts, we discover that there are basically this like dynasties of saints. One text that I explored in the past is the so-called fourth book of the Maccabees, the text that is in the Greek Bible. And in this text, we have a priest named Eleazar, and we have a woman and her seven sons, and they all die as martyrs. And nowhere in the Greek text does it say that they're in any way related to each other. In the Coptic tradition, they are a family. So the priest, Eleazar, is the husband of the woman and the father of their seven sons. And this is actually in the Coptic text of the fourth book of the Maccabees. So there's this tendency to make everybody related, which you also find in various martyrdom narratives, which also can be kind of connected with each other by means of genealogy. So I would very tentatively suspect that maybe something like this happens here. So this is one example of this sort of textual fluidity when a story that is assigned to one apostle becomes assigned to somebody else. And of course, there are many other examples, like sometimes the genre is changed, right? So for instance, we have this text known as the martyrdom of Matthew. It begins with Matthew, you know, coming to a certain place to preach and then very soon dying a martyr. And then in some codex, a scribe was tasked with copying only texts that contain the apostolic preachings. So texts that tell the story that precedes the martyr. So what did he do? He added a sort of kind of long preface telling about how all the apostles gathered together and received their allotted territories. And then he removed the part where Matthew actually dies. So the same story, like the text that was initially a martyrdom, was by this kind of very rude procedure simply converted to, to a preaching, which doesn't end with martyrdom else with triumph. So this sort of attitude towards text as something that can be transformed, you know, in accordance to the needs of the audience, the needs of the scribe, the needs of the donor who actually paid for the production of the codex. This is very typical for this sort of literature. And that's why it's, it's so interesting to compare text with each other, because sometimes you can find a very small detail that is different and then you just start thinking about like why would somebody want to to change that for instance again in the preaching of philip we have this man preaching from on top of the pillar and there is a thunderstorm and everybody is terrified and there are lightning bolts and everybody is trying to hide and then in one manuscript it says that and many men and women you know died this day and then the other manuscript instead says, uh, like, many people were terrified and, and many pregnant women lost their children, like lost the fruit of their loins. So why this change? So one possibility is that somebody was reading this narrative and felt that, well, maybe that's too much. Like, you know, the apostles come to a city and just starting killing people without giving them a chance to actually repent. And so instead of just saying that many people died that day, it changed it to like, you know, many unborn fetuses died that day. And somehow this is not as horrible because, you know, this is just something that happens a lot in the, you know, pre-modern society that, you know, pregnant women lose their children. This is kind of something that is not as horrifying as it is today. So this sort of details, they are endless. I'm actually planning to produce a study, uh, an article about this uh, phenomenon of textual fluidity in Coptic apocryphal acts to produce some sort of a catalog of things that can happen. And it's actually, I think, easy to look into this stuff if you, again, consult these volumes by Tony Burke, because uh, Tony is uh, very fond of basically synoptic charts and tables and comparative tools. So very often when you have a text in the volume, not necessarily Coptic text, there would be several columns which allow you to compare different versions of the text. And then you can play with it and you can think why would uh, a text be performed differently in different manuscripts. So that's some 
exercise that I encourage everybody to do. I think that's a lot of fun. This question in general was something I, I was talking to Dr. Burke about as well. It's kind of tied in with the value judgments that we have when we say something is apocryphal versus something is canonical. We lose sight of the fact that this has been going on as long as these texts have been around, even as far back as the comp composition of the Iliad and the Odyssey in 7th century BCE is reacting against these shared materials and traditions and creating almost like the first postmodern text. You find the same thing in the New Testament canonical gospels, so to speak. You have Mark, Matthew, Luke, and then you have John. And you think of John almost as the, oh brother, where art thou of the traditional texts in those three synoptics. John is creating kind of his own understanding, correcting things that he sees kind of maybe deficient in those texts. And I think a lot of the problem with people being so reticent to kind of look at these texts on their own terms is that we have those value judgments when we say these words like, oh, this is apocryphal or non-canonical, therefore it's not true. Whereas something that's in the canon, we have modern conceptions of what those are versus maybe in the ancient world, just as you've been saying the whole time, like these texts were considered fluid. They were considered adaptable to different situations, depending on the needs of the audience and the writer. Why do you think these optic apocryphal acts have been so neglected and steady up until recently? There are two reasons. First is that we have the Nakamadi library. And for decades, people learned Coptic only to read the text from Nag Hammadi, which is understandable because these texts are amazing and they pose a lot of questions and they do require a certain training to work with them. So I know that for several times, the Congress of Coptic Studies, which is like the main event in, in our field, which happens only once in four years, would be dedicated entirely to Nag Hammadi stuff. Because, you know, why would you do Coptic studies if you don't work on Nang Hamadi? This is like the most brilliant corpus of text there is. So everything else was kind of considered to be late, uninteresting, orthodox, boring, liturgical, whatever. Which is, of course, not true. This stuff is exciting. And also, if you look at it, you wouldn't see any Chinese wall between the so-called Gnostic texts, the Nakamadi texts, you know, Pistis Sophia, and the Slater apocryphal texts. For instance, there is one thing that is immediately striking, and that's how both the Scarpera are indebted to magic. So, you know, people who read Nakamadi texts, they very soon would find the so-called Vokis Magikai, Nomina Barbara, various sequences of meaningless words that in the manuscript would be marked with the supralineers, indicating that they have certain power, that these are words that can make things happen, right? And when we look into this later Coptic Apocrypha, when we even look into texts that narrate the story of Jesus, we find very similar stuff. For instance, my colleague, Roxanne Belanger-Serazin, who is also working here at the University of Oslo, she is an expert in magic. She drew my attention to this manuscript of the Acts of Pilate, which is about the last day of Jesus Christ. And in this text, in one of the manuscripts, which comes from the White Monastery, Jesus on the cross basically utters just a long sequence of this uh, nomina barbara, of this vocus magicae. In this manuscript, the words are marked with the supralineers clearly resembling what in magical papyri would be magical words of power. And this is a manuscript produced in the White Monastery, in the same monastery that was producing the manuscripts of Shenouta, so in the stronghold of orthodoxy. So somehow certain traditions remained, and I can even say that, you know, in order to understand the Nakamadi literature better, we certainly cannot ignore this later texts, uh, even though they are liturgical, whatever this means. So this is one thing that historically the Nag Hammadi was just too big of a phenomenon to allow people to see anything else. But I think today we are slowly growing to appreciate the Nag Hammadi literature as part of Coptic literature. And again, 
I must say that here at the University of Oslo, the project working on this stuff is doing excellent work, a collective effort. And that's important that actually the best scholarship is the scholarship done in a team or at least in consultation and dialogue with others. So it's a collective work. Brilliant colleagues who have been contributing a lot to the field and uh, actually the place where I'm at now, the Faculty of Theology at the University of Oslo is a nice demonstration of this because here uh, there is an entire European Research Council funded project dedicated specifically to Coptic Apocrypha. So I also want to mention Dylan Burns, who he has been also very active in pointing out this important connections between Nag Hammadi literature and magical literature. And the other thing is, as I said, the state of survival, the fact that the manuscripts we have are in fragments. So like in my edition of the uh, Preaching of Philip, I brought together fragments from, I think, uh, five different collections, right? And this is kind of the simple case, right? Like sometimes you have fragments from various different collections with, you know, one tiny fragment from Paris joining another tiny fragment from London. And like together you try to make sense of them. And to make sense of them, you need to consult the Arabic evidence and, you know, Ethiopic evidence, wherever. So this is usually a very complicated task. This makes it somehow difficult to access this data. And that's why, because we didn't have proper editions, and we still, for many texts, don't have proper editions, these texts are not as well known as they should be. But I hope that this situation will change soon and that this literature will eventually be integrated into what we know about late antique Christianity, because this is an important part of late antique spirituality in general, I would say. I think this is like, why is it so exciting to work in this field? Because today, these uh, walls are finally falling and, uh, you know, New Testament people are learning to appreciate Nag Hammadi people and Nag Hammadi people are learning to appreciate magic people. And uh, there is uh, this constant exchange of ideas. And my colleague, Korsha Dozu, is now going to edit a volume of uh, Coptic magical texts. And to my great surprise, one of these magical texts that he edited there actually mentions Philemon. If I remember correctly, it's a, it's a spell that is actually related to like a singing voice. So somebody, probably uh, in connection to church service, performs this spell to acquire a good voice. And he addresses some sort of deity or demon and says that, well, I want to have a sweet voice like that of Philemon. So, I mean, again, all these people, all these texts, they existed in the same kind of environment and they were constantly sharing ideas with each other and whatnot. Magic influenced apocryphal literature, apocryphal literature influenced magic. And only when we consider all this stuff as a one beautiful world of ideas, we would really learn to appreciate it. The common denominator for me, whether it be apocalyptic literature, whether it be these apocryphal acts, texts, any of these things, it comes from a kind of scribal milieu, right? Mm -hmm. These are very learned people You're constantly glossing things when you're writing stuff down. You were mentioning Philemon's voice, and I was reminded of my uh, awesome discussion with Dr. Uh, Collins. I didn't get Apocalypse of Abraham in there for time, but just the concept of the sweet voice, the angel uh, Yawael, he's the singer of the most high God. So he's like got the sweetest voice. He has this song and I can imagine certain people appropriating this song maybe in their <laughs> magical you know, experiences because they give you the actual lyrics and everything. So the unsung heroes of anything we read, whether that be our Nag Hammadi volumes, whether that be our Old Testament pseudepigrapha volumes, or even our collected Greek novels or Homer, they rely on these textus receptus, these authoritative texts by these people who go out to like remote monasteries and like dumps, dumpsters, and put these things together and have to go to museums. So you really are the, uh, all of you, not just you, Dr. Maroshnikov, but all of your colleagues, all the people working on this, Dylan Burns, our rock star, uh, is, uh, you know, you know, all, all of you are just doing amazing work. And, uh, I just want to thank you for that. There are some volumes forthcoming 
So there will be a volume called Para Biblica Coptica, which is a volume I'm editing. So it will hopefully appear this year already in uh, Germany in uh, Morzebek uh, Publishing House. So it will be dedicated specifically to Coptic Apocrypha. And here in Oslo, Hugo Lundhaug and his uh, colleagues are uh, also preparing a volume on Coptic Apocrypha, which will be a volume of studies. And as far as I understand, there is also a volume of translations in the works. So uh, hopefully your hunger for Coptic Apocrypha will be quenched thanks to these publications. And um, yeah, as I said, the volumes by Tony Burke are also an extremely nice introduction to the topic. Dr. Maroshnikov, this has been amazing. I want to thank you. I think this is an amazing initiative. I really enjoy it for the second time. And I, I really hope that you continue doing this. It was thank a lot you. of fun. So this is a roundabout way of uh, Yvonne telling everybody to go learn Coptic.